Hi, I'm Tom Luna. I'm a former school board member. I was privileged to serve as senior advisor to U.S. Secretary of Education, Rod Page. I also had the honor of serving for eight years as Idaho State Superintendent of Public Instruction. During that time, I also served as president of the Council of Chief State School Officers. One thing I have learned in all these experiences is that educating children is not rocket science, it's more complicated. On my podcast, Swimming Upstream, we will visit with courageous leaders who challenge the prevailing tide and inspire all of us to swim against the current. Let's jump in. Welcome to another episode of Swimming Upstream, and we are here in Salt Lake City at the Excel in Ed conference, and we're talking to uh, education leaders across the country and those people that have been swimming upstream to help improve education uh, uh, for more students across the country. And while we've been here, we've talked to a lot of state superintendents, we've talked to some CEOs, we've talked to a teacher, but one per- one group we haven't talked to are legislators, and they play a critical role. In, in this whole education process because of the funding that uh, that runs through legislatures and across the governor's desk and also the policies and rules and laws that are passed that uh, kind of set the direction and the framework for education. Um, I used to tell f- uh, folks that when I was in office, I can't cast one vote, I can't sign one bill, right? That's up to the legislature and the, go- and the governor. And so we have an education leader and legislator, Scott Betke from Idaho, the current Speaker of the House in Idaho and the Lieutenant Governor elect in, in Idaho. And welcome it's good to, to be here, Tom. Yeah, great to have you here. Scott is a great friend. We've, uh, we've done a lot of uh, work in education and, and um, gone to a lot of dinners with our wives and stuff together. We've had a lot of conversations and worked together on a lot of efforts to improve education. True that. So let, let's talk about you when you came into the legislature. Tell that quick story. You came in <clears throat> because of some things that were affecting you and your work as a rancher specifically, but quickly education became a, a new focus of well, yours. Well, because uh, at the very start, I was appointed. And so that made me the least senior person in the state, in the in the House anyway. And, uh, and, and they put me on education committee. Nobody uh, wanted to be on education. Nobody, back in those days, I mean, that was a, that, you know, they called it a meat grinder. I mean, it was, their, you know, tough issues. And people Bankless. did not want to be on the education committee. And as the most junior person in the house, guess where they put me? <laughs> hey, put the new guy in education. And I, uh, uh, you know, but no, but no one had lived their life or tried to influence the life of their kids in a more pro-education way than I had mine, and so I uh, I started asking a lot of questions, and uh, and some of them weren't, I guess, politically correct. Well, they were politically correct, but they were rock the boat. Type. You were swimming against the stream, going yeah, against the we're current. Swimming upstream, yeah. yeah. And we were asking questions that that, rock, that did rock the boat. And in that next election cycle, the education stakeholders came after me and recruited my you know candidates for the next few cycles to get me out of the legislature. Uh, you know, you know, ultimately, I uh, you know I left the education committee, but then went on the appropriations committee and was the guy that uh, that set all of the education. Uh, budgets because I was now, quote, in a safe district because I had won those elections so easily back home. And so I was able to do the type of things that you and I started with way back when. And uh, we, you know, the way we budgeted for education, we changed that. Uh, and we so, started so, asking- talk a little bit about that because um, for it, it, it's a bit wonkish, but I think it's very interesting, and I think it's it's telling, right? Because we we like many states, um, we would pass an appropriation for education, and it was just this bucket of money that then was going to be divided up, right. and nobody could really tell how it was being spent. And you created a, a creative way of dividing that up into several different budgets that were handled separately. Correct. Um, you know, in fact, the the old legislators or the seasoned legislators told me when I first got in there, don't, you know, appreciate the questions that you're asking in the committee. But during debate, 
you know, here's this one omnibus bill. It's more than half of the state's uh, general fund. Just shut up and vote for it. Yeah. You know, let we'll fix things as we go, but it's not it's not when you first see the uh, the budget bill. So when I became the budgeter and and uh, they you know and since I was quote safe, then uh, then I said, well, then we're going to do a few things a little differently. Also, uh, politically, you know, Republicans were getting a bad rap that they were against kids and whatnot. And I said, so fine, let's just have a child, uh, you know, a kid's budget. We'll have a kid's budget. We'll have a teacher's budget. We'll have a superintendent's budget. We'll have uh, an administration budget, yeah. and uh, facilities budget. And we'll just, we'll, we'll break them down, clear down so that extra votes in one subject area don't drag, uh, you know, the, the subject across the line in the other areas of these, of these omnibus bills. And so we met with a lot of resistance when we broke that up. In fact, uh, that was the longest, uh, until recently, that was the longest uh, legislative session in state history. And that was largely because of this uh, controversy. But we hung tough and we got it through. And that's how they still do it today is the way that we did it. So high level of transparency when yeah. you've seen where the money Every is going. Every dollar you can follow. Yeah. And you don't just make a vote because I'm pro-education. So the, some of the other things that uh, happen in the legislature focus on things that you'll hear a lot in this conference, like um, literacy, uh, school choice. Um, talk to us about, you know, navigating those waters in the legislature when there is resistance. And but but uh, but people want to push against the resistance. They want to swim upstream, if you will. Uh, but, but still, there is this resistance. And how do you navigate that? Even as Speaker of the House, where you're trying to you know, find pathways and avenues for uh, good bills to become law. Well, my takeaway here, just of participating in what little I have in the last two days, is, man, there needs to be more Idaho policymakers here. Because some of the some of the paradigms that we are count on uh, are are not the state of the art. I mean, just just this reading uh, deal that we just went through here, and and the science of reading, we have doubled down on the wrong way to teach kids to read in Idaho. Well, we're gonna we're gonna spend twice as much on the but it's on the wrong thing. <laughs> well, that's that's my point. <laughs> right, and uh, I. You know, and, I, and as you said in my introduction, I just finished a statewide campaign uh, that started 18 months ago. But here's one thing that I think is it gives me reason to be optimistic: is that it doesn't matter whether you're they're Republicans or Democrats or any shape or shade uh, of those things. Every parent, every grandparent wants their kid to have access to a good education. I mean, the fight goes out of the room when you come back to what would they want for their children. And it's a, it's a good education so they can get a good job, so that they can you know, participate in the American dream. And that's exactly where it starts. And so this whole thing about having a positive business climate that we, you know, and, and people led with a chamber of commerce type approach uh, in politics in Idaho for a lot of years, that cannot happen if you don't have access to a quality education. You know, so we've, we're talking in terms of every Idaho kid getting, being able to get an Idaho job. Well, if you're gonna, but if you're gonna have an Idaho job ready for them, you got to have a positive business climate. But you cannot have a positive business climate if, unless you have uh, a, a an educated workforce, and the two go hand in hand. And that's what we'll concentrate on as we go forward. I'm pretty excited about what we're hearing out here and the new changes that. Uh, you know, they're afoot and all of the kindred spirits that are in places like this and would that uh, more of my colleagues would be exposed to this. Uh, Scott, one, one of the things that uh, you and I have talked about before, and I think it, this happens all across the country, is we, we have aspirations for education and we, we have campaigns and we talk about the things that, we, that need to be done. We hear from people uh, of the things that they want to see done differently. Um, and we can even go and, you know, try to govern and, and focus on those only to find out we have a funding formula or an accountability system or we have policies and laws in place that work really against making those aspirations come true. 
So talk about, you know, the, that, the, that part of the resistance. And a lot of people wouldn't recognize unless they, you know, were in, in the system like a funding formula and how right. that can really <laughs> hamstring uh, some of the things that, that you hear at this conference and well, elsewhere. And then, and, and then it it's becomes worse than that. So changing the whole way we fund education, is that's a huge hill to climb. So we just we end up putting Band-Aids on an on a old system. And then, then the ability to understand the system becomes less and less the more Band-Aids and, and the more workarounds that we put in. And so that's exactly right. And, but in every other thing... Uh, you know, we're also in business, you and I, and but we don't handle any other thing in our life the way we hand, handle education. We, we make investments with hard-earned money, and we expect a, a series or a list of results. In business. In business. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, and so, but we're putting a lot of money in education, and we think we're buying something or, you know, that our investment is going to result, have results. And then when it doesn't, then we don't go back like we do in business and change the fundamentals of, uh, of aligning our expectations with, uh, with the money. And so, uh, you know, and I, I'm not here to bash education. I mean, it's, uh, everybody's heart is in the right spot on this. And, but the problem sometimes is that everybody's had a little different experience because we've all been through the education yeah, system. Yeah. So therefore, we're experts, right? Yeah. And uh, uh, and so there's a, you know, even at this conference, there's a lot of parallel paths. It's kind of high time we bring some of them together, I think. What would be your advice for an elected official, whether at the legislative level, even an elected state superintendent or a <clears throat> lieutenant governor, governor, when it comes to those hard decisions, when it comes to, you know, you're going to have to go against the current, you're going to have to swim upstream in order to, to uh, right. do some of the hard things that are necessary to, so that, to your point, we all aspire to a better education system. It's just uh, difficult to overcome the obstacles. Well, I think it's a basic fundamental that if you're a leader, if people trust you enough to elect you or, you know, through a ballot or by acclamation to be the leader, then you are, you are by definition, a teacher. And so just because you have the title does not mean that people are going to, you know, they trust you enough to, to take the first few steps with you, but you're going to have to teach them uh, you know, your vision, you're going to have to be able to, to articulate your vision and they're going to have to go, Hmm, that makes sense. And it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take persistence. It's going to take patience <laughs> and then it's going to take more persistence and then it's going to take more patience. And, and you, we've got to, uh, meet these people where they are. They're not going to, they're not going to come to us. And so, that would be my best or my only advice is to know your craft, know what you're talking about, buy into it. I mean, if you're bought into it, then you can be excited enough to teach it and explain it. But uh, just because you know it and, and it's in your head doesn't make it so for everyone else. And so that you are going to have to be a teacher if you're going to be an effective leader. And it may, it may require some political risk. Right. To do the right thing, to exactly. cast those tough votes. Exactly. Don't take too many of them because then you'll be replaced by somebody that will not take any risks. So go. it's a careful balance here. of, And that's why I'm, I mean, you took some risks in your career. I've taken some in mine, but we, but we hedged our bets because we had done our homework. We knew that it, we knew that it was a better way and we were willing to, uh, to put it on the line, but we hedged our bets politically by going out and doing the behind the scenes homework that made, you know, I, made I remember you referring that. to it as missionary work. Exactly. You, know, you, you go and do your missionary work, right? Well, that's because I think that's the, the most applicable uh, analogy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've had the privilege of visiting with Scott Bedke, the <laughs> Lieutenant Governor elect of the great state of Idaho, my home state. Uh, and Scott, before we go, we've been asking all of our guests, share with us one unique fact or fun fact about your state, Idaho, that most people probably don't know. 
Well, that's a that's a great question, and of course, I could so I go immediately back to fourth grade where we all took our Idaho history. Class. You want to sing the state song? Sure you, you, no, I, let, let, I, let, I, let's I, not. I, let's not do that. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, Hell's Canyon is the is the deepest gorge in the United States, and it's beautiful. Deeper than the Grand Canyon. It's deeper than the Grand Canyon. Shoshone Falls is higher than Niagara Falls. Uh, these are these are things that us kids take for granted. But Idaho is a beautiful state. Uh, it, we believe that it's the best place to live, to work, and to raise a family. And we've been doing taking care of the fundamentals of our state government really pretty well for decades. Now people have discovered Yeah, we've been it. discovered, yes. And we don't get to go back. And so there's going to be growing pains in each of these areas, including education. Yeah. And so doubling down on the past is not going to necessarily be the recipe for success in the future. Wow, that's great leadership and great counsel. And Scott Betke has been a guest here on Swimming Upstream and sharing his experience as a legislator and now the incoming Lieutenant Governor of Idaho. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Tom. Thank you for listening. And remember, our children may only be 22% of our population, but they represent 100% of our future. If you found this conversation valuable, subscribe to our YouTube channel and find us on your favorite podcast platform. Swimming Upstream is part of the Stratagos Podcast Network. To view the entire lineup of our shows, visit our website, stratagosgroup.com.